Good morning. My name is Richard Dolan, and this is my family. We've come here this morning to share what Jesus is doing in our hearts. And we're just praying that at some point through this, it will touch your heart. My daughter Elizabeth is going to start out. Good morning, everyone. So God has been speaking to me about living a holy life and trusting Him with my life and depending on Him for my every need. And so um, if you have your Bible, go to Hebrews 10, verse 4. Because the blood of bulls and goats is powerless to take sins away, hence when He, Christ, entered into the world, He said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but instead you have made ready a body for me to offer. In burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no delight. Then I said, Behold, here I am, coming to do your will, O God, to fulfill what is written of me in the volume of the book. And we'll stop right there. It says we no longer have to get, give sacrifices for our sins, but now we have a permanent eraser, and that's repentance. Let's read, read on. When he said, Just before you have neither desire nor have you taken delight in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings, all of which are offered according to the law. He then went on to say, Behold, here I am coming to do your will. Thus he does away with and annuls the first order as a means of expiating sin so that he might inaugurate and establish the latter order. And in accordance with this will of God, we have been made holy, consecrated and sanctified through the offering made once and for all of the body of Jesus Christ, the Anointed One. And this is where Jesus died on the cross for us. And through that, we have repentance. And we don't have to sin. He made it to where we can live holy lives and we can depend on Him for our every need. And when we do make a mistake, if we cut Jesus off in any area, we can repent and it's erased out of our book. And through this, we can hear God's voice and we can obey. And that's part of living a holy life. And in verse 21 of Hebrews 10, it says, And since we have such a great and wonderful and noble priest who rules over the house of God, let us all come forward and draw near with true, honest, and sincere hearts in unqualified assurance and absolute conviction engendered by faith, by that leaning of the entire human personality on God in absolute trust and confidence in His power, wisdom, and goodness, having our hearts sprinkled and purified from a guilty, evil conscience and our bodies cleansed and with pure water. So let us seize and hold fast and retain with wavering the hope ch we cherish and confess in our acknowledgement of it. For he who promised is reliable, sure, and he's faithful to his word. And this is how I want to live daily. I want to come forward and draw near <coughs> to God with, honest, with an honest and sincere heart. And it also says with an absolute conviction engendered by faith. And I want that faith to be built in me where I know Jesus is going to hear me and I'm going to hear his voice when he speaks to me and I can trust him with my life no matter what happens. And drawing near to God with faith is you have total reliance on him and you depend on him for your every need. And that's part of living a holy life because when we depend on him, we're not giving to sin. We're not thinking about ourselves, but our eyes are on Jesus. And that's the key is to keep your eyes on Jesus every moment of the day. And it going back to seize and hold fast. That's what I want to do every moment because Jesus is faithful to us. And we need to be faithful to him. And we need to believe him. And he will... Everything He does for us, He causes us to believe Him because He's so faithful. And I want to believe Jesus with every fiber of my being and just trust Him with my life and depend on Him. And every day we can hear God's voice and obey Him and stay in His presence every moment of the day. 
And like I said, we can live holy lives. We don't have to give to sin. Jesus is there for us to speak to us what to do, to speak to us what to say. Every moment of our day can be based off what Jesus is telling us. And when we do that, we're not giving to sin. And if we do miss it and don't do exactly what he's told us to do, we can repent and get right back on track. And that's what Jesus has been really speaking to me. And it's really becoming real to me where I can depend on Jesus and I can hear his voice and obey. That's right. As Elizabeth was saying, we can live holy lives. So I want to read a couple of scriptures to you First, in First Peter chapter 1, verse 15. But as the one who called you is holy, you yourselves also be holy in all your conduct and manner of living. And that's what the way Jesus wants us to live. In whatever we do, whatever we say, He wants us to have a place in our hearts where we want to be holy. We want to say what He wants us to say. We want to fi- have the feelings He wants us to have. We want to do what He wants us to do, to be in His will all the time. Verse 16 says, For it is written, You shall be holy, for I am holy. And it, you know, the devil comes with his lies, and he's going to say, you know, you know you cannot do that. Look at the way you've been in your past, or look even how you are still now. Um, you're, you'll never be able to be holy. But God says in his word, in verse 16, for it is written, you shall be, you will be holy for I am holy. As we have that relationship with Jesus, we believe in him, we surrender our lives to him, he'll make us holy. He'll change our attitudes. He'll change our thinking. He'll change our whole way we live. And it's a wonderful life living, live, giving our hearts to Jesus and living for him. Our, my next scripture is in Philippians 3. And it's in verse, I want to start at verse 13. It says, I do not consider, brethren, that I have captured and made it my own yet. But one thing I do, it is my one aspiration, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. We don't have to dwell on our past. We don't have to dwell on how we used to be. But Jesus, we can we can. Re- believe in Jesus and him live in our hearts we can be dead to that sin we can like Elizabeth was talking about we can come to Jesus and we can truly repent not just um, say I'm sorry but we can truly repent mean it from our hearts have that godly sorrow in our hearts that only God can put there and we can truly repent and it can be erased out of our lives it we can be changed people when we give our hearts to Jesus. My life, the next scripture is verse 14. I press on toward the goal to win the supreme and heavenly prize to which God in Christ Jesus is calling us upward. Verse 15. So let those of us who are spiritually mature and full grown have this mind and hold these convictions. And if any respect, and if in any respect you have a different attitude of of mind, God will make that clear to you also. So God will show us when our lives are not right, when something we may do is wrong. We can trust God. He'll show us what is wrong in our lives so we can come to Him and repent and get our hearts and our lives right. I mean, every day it's a fight to know Jesus. If we have faith and confidence in Him, we can continually go forward in our relationship with Jesus. And we will make it to heaven. That's what we're all striving for. It's real. Jesus is coming back. And we want to be with Him. My last scripture is Acts 4.12. And I want to read it to you out of the New Amplified Bible. It says, And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven that has been given among people by which we must be saved. For God has provided the world no alternative for salvation. There is no other name. There is no other salvation except salvation through Jesus Christ and what he did for us on the cross. 
There's one door and there's one way to Jesus. We must believe on him, striving every day to hear his voice for every step in our lives. Obeying him with what we hear by doing what God says for us and not what we want to do in our own selfish desires. You know, in Romans 1.28, it talks about considering Jesus worth the knowing. And that is with every part of our lives, everything we do, whether it's what we do at home, what we do in our jobs, even how we drive our cars, how we take care of our families, how we take care of our children. Jesus wants to be Lord of all. And if we'll consider him worth the knowing by going to him and asking him, how, how do I, what should I do now? How do I need to do this? How do I need to, to say this to this person? Just having that personal relationship with him, then he loves us so much. He's going to change us. He knows what's best for us, and he is going to make sure that we make it. He is going to give us that grace to, to know him. Well, I'm going to start with uh, Acts 5.31. And, you know, God had a plan. And, you know, his plan was that Jesus was going to be the ultimate sacrifice for us so we could come back into right relationship with him. And it says in uh, Acts 5.31, God exalted Jesus. It says him talking about Jesus to his right hand to be prince and leader and savior and deliver and preserver in order to grant repentance to Israel and to bestow forgiveness and release from sin. God wants us to walk holy. That's where we've been in all of our scriptures tonight. We do not have to sin. All we've got to do is cry out to Jesus at every point of our life to hear his voice and do, just simply obey, just simply obey what he tells us to do. My next scripture is in 2 Peter, and it's in 2 Peter 3, 9. Let me get to it here. Sorry, it's taking so long here. Second Peter three nine. And it says here, the Lord does not delay and is not tardy or slow about what he promises, according to some people's conception of slowness. But he is long suffering extraordinarily patient towards you, not desiring that any should perish, but that all should turn to repentance. You know, the, the mercy and the grace of God is just way beyond what we can think or imagine. His love comes over and over and over again to help us to come out of the sin that we've lived in in the past or where we've got a problem and we haven't totally surrendered our heart. But God loves us so much that he will keep granting us that place of repentance. And, and all we've got to do is just humble our hearts and truly see, Jesus, please forgive me. I see that this is wrong. Change my heart. I don't want to do this anymore. Please forgive me, Jesus. So at that point, he erases it and it's forgotten. And that's the mercy and grace of God. And that's the love of God that he has for us, that he'll do whatever it takes to help us serve him and walk in that holiness. So my next scripture is in Ephesians 5.
Ephesians 5, 1 and 2. It says, Therefore be imitators of God, copy him, and follow his example, as well-beloved children imitate their father. And walk in love, esteeming and delighting in one another, as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a slain offering and sacrifice to God for you, so that it became a sweet fragrance. You know, the like I was talking about the, the love of God, where he he has just done, I mean, he sacrificed his own son for us, just so we can come back and have the right relationship with him, so we can walk daily in his presence. We can walk in that holiness that he said that we should be holy because he's holy. You know, he he loves us so much. And then we can go to Revelations 3.19. And it says here, Those whom I dearly and tenderly love, I tell their faults and convict and convince and reprove and chasten. I discipline and instruct them. So be enthusiastic and in earnest and burning with zeal and repent, changing your mind and your attitude. You know, there there is no salvation without correction. If he doesn't correct us, and convict our hearts of where we've missed it, there will be no, there will be no salvation. And he says here that when the discipline comes, he instructs us as to what the right way is. So we won't continually go back and we can have that true place of repentance where we've come and we've acknowledged our sin We know what we've done wrong, and we've said it in our heart. Jesus, I'm trusting you. I'm trusting you that I am not going to do this anymore because I know I can't do it without you. So the the next scripture I have is Acts 3.19. And it says, so repent, change your mind and purpose, turn around and return to God, that your sins may be erased, blotted out, wiped clean, that times of refreshing and recovering from the effects of heat, a reviving with a fresh air may come from the presence of the Lord. So as It's saying there, repent, have a change of heart, have a change of mind. And when you do and you truly repent, there's the refreshing. There's the peace that comes from when you've had that, you're in the presence with God. Hello, everyone. So I have a few more scriptures to add to that. Um, If you'll look at Hebrews 10, verse 18, it says, Now where there is absolute remission, forgiveness, and cancellation of the penalty of these sins and lawlessness, lawbreaking, there is no longer any offering made to atone for sin. Therefore, brethren, since we have full freedom and confidence to enter the Holy of Holies by the power and virtue in the blood of Jesus, and it keeps going, but I want to stop there. It says we have full freedom and confidence to enter into the Holy of Holies. Under the law, no one could go into the Holy of Holies that had any sin in their life. Now, God has made it so that we can come straight to him and ask him for forgiveness for anything we miss him with. Anytime we miss him, we do not hear his voice and we give to sin. We can just repent. We can be cut to the heart. We can be contrite and sorrowful for our sin and repent to him. Just ask him for forgiveness. And there's freedom from that sin once we repent. It's wiped out of our book and there's no need for us to feel any more guilt. But We cannot take this freedom lightly. We have to be very grateful for it. So if you go with me to Galatians 5 verse 13. 
it says, For you, brethren, were indeed called to freedom. That freedom is the freedom that we have um, from repentance, the freedom that it gives us from sin. Only do not let your freedom be an incentive an incentive to your flesh and an opportunity or excuse for selfishness, but through love you should serve one another. That freedom that God has given us does not mean that we can go out and do whatever we want, regardless of whether it's sin or not, and just repent later. God doesn't work that way. He wants to be speaking to us in every single thing we do and showing us how to live our lives day by day, minute by minute, and moment by moment. Now, if you go back to Hebrews 10, and if you look in verse 24, it says, And let us consider and give attention, continuous care to watching over one another, studying how we may stir up, stimulate, and incite to love and helpful deeds and noble activities, not forsaking or neglecting to assemble together as believers, as is the habit of some people, but admonishing, warning, urging, and encouraging one another, and all the more faithfully as you see the day approaching. As my mom said, Jesus is coming back. So we need to look forward to correction as getting us closer and closer to heaven. Every time we're corrected, we are getting closer and closer to heaven because we're becoming closer and closer to the holiness that God ascribes. So let's look at verse 26. For if we go on deliberately and willingly sinning after once acquiring the knowledge of the truth, there is no longer any sacrifice left to atone for our sins, no further offering to which to look forward. This is saying that if we go on sinning, we go on living lives once we know the truth and we keep doing things without inquiring of God and doing things we know are wrong without considering Jesus worth the knowing, as my mom also said, then there is no atonement for us. There's no further offering to which we can look forward, that offering being that repentance. Verse 27, there is nothing left for us then but a kind of awful and fearful prospect and expectation of divine judgment and the fury of burning wrath and indignation which will consume those who put themselves in opposition to God. Verse 28, any person who is violated and thus rejected and set at naught the law of Moses is put to death without pity or mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. So if you let that sink in for just a moment, it's saying that on the account of two or three witnesses, you could be put to death under the law. So now, since Jesus has died for us with repentance, we can repent and we can be cleared from guilt. But if we spurn that gift and we don't consider it worth the knowing, we don't consider God worth the knowing, and we don't repent for our sin, then God's judgment will come on us. And we have to be grateful. I mean, God sent his only son to die for us. Jesus came to earth as a human. He didn't have to go to the cross, but he chose to for our sakes, to cover our sin, to give us healing, to give us forgiveness. So if we do not consider that gift precious, and be very grateful for it, then God's judgment will be poured out on us, and it will be very serious. How much worse, sterner, and heavier punishment do you suppose he will be judged to deserve, who has spurned and thus trampled underfoot the Son of God, who has considered the covenant blood by which he was consecrated common and unhallowed, thus profaning it and insulting and outraging the Holy Spirit, who imparts grace, the unmerited favor, and blessing of God? We do not know what the judgment of God will be on us. Some people in the Bible, God's judgment came on, dropped dead. We have to consider it as a very, very serious thing. Verse 30, For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, retribution and the metting out of full justice rests with me. I will repay, I will exact the compensation, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge and determine and solve and settle the cause and the cases of his people. It is a fearful, formidable, and terrible thing to incur the divine penalties and be cast in the, into the hands of the living God. Somewhere in the Bible it says, if we are not the friend of God, we are the enemy of God. And we all know we do not want to be the enemy of God. So now let's look, look at 1 John 1 verse 9. 
If we freely admit that we have sinned and confess our sins, he is faithful and just, true to his own nature and promises, and will forgive our sins, dismiss our lawlessness, and continuously cleanse us from all unrighteousness, everything not in conformity to his will and purpose, thought and action. God is faithful. God will forgive us if we repent and we freely admit our sin. And if you don't know what your sin is, that's okay. You can cry out to God and he will show you. There have been many times in my own life where I didn't know what I did wrong, but I felt cut off from God. So I just got on my face and cried out to God and he showed me what my sin was. I could then say, Jesus, I see what I did was wrong. Please forgive me. And that's how we have to live every moment of our lives. Just in that humility of Jesus, I want to be holy. I want to live the way you want me to live second by second. Verse 10, if we say, claim, we have not sinned, we contradict his word and make him out to be false and a liar and his word is not in us. The divine message of the gospel is not in our hearts. And yes, we're going to make mistakes that we have the sin nature in us. But as we as we let the Holy Spirit guide our lives, we don't have to make mistakes anymore. And when we do, we just repent and we get back in right standing with God. So let's go back to Hebrews 10. And we'll look in verse 38. But the just shall live by faith. My righteous servant shall live by his conviction respecting man's relationship to God and divine things and holy fervor born of faith and conjoin with it. And if he draws back and shrinks in fear, my soul has no delight or pleasure in him. So we're going to live by faith and let everything we do garner faith coming from us that God will give us forgiveness in everything we do. And that's how we have to live our lives. Faith in God that He will give us forgiveness for any sin when we are contrite and we cry out to Him. So we're going to sing a song now about the blood of Jesus and Him dying on the cross and how it can save us from sin and from going to hell. For so many years, so many limbs were offered up, but all the blood that was shed could never fill that bitter cup till one spotless lamb in the form of man gave his life on calvary his was the only blood that could ever set men free for his blood was not just blood of another spotless lamb the sins of man. His blood inhales my body and it sets my spirit free. I'm so glad His precious blood was shed for you and me. And no other blood much for listening today. You can go to our website at wordoffaithfellowship.org 
and you can hear all of our other programs, including this one. We love you so much. What an honor to be with you today. We hope everyone has a great day. Thank you.